Hey, Deborah, thanks so much for being on the show. It's such an honor to have you. Thanks for having me. I want to ask you a few off the cuff questions. If you had all the money in the world, what would you do with it? I can tell you, I have thought about this because I have dreams of winning the lottery. My grandmother, Ella May Durr, was the kindest, sweetest person I have ever known. So if I had all the money in the world, I will set up a foundation and it would be titled Ella's House Foundation. And the mission of the foundation would be practicing random acts of kindness. Now, how would that transpire? If there is some sort of devastation in the state, the nation, or country, I would send a representative out to that place and find out who is in the greatest need. And we will make sure that person, the family, the organization on the ground would have the tools to help people who are in need. No one would be able to contact our foundation, but we will be able to put money and resources out to the people who have the greatest need. Ergo, practicing random acts of kindness. I listen to NPR all the time. I can't take the news, but so much actually seeing the visuals, but I do know where things are in disarray and I would, use a lot of that money, a lot of the proceeds to help others. Wow, you've really given it some deep thought and and I really appreciate the philanthropic nature you have. That's pretty good. <laughs> and that was something that I like to believe was instilled in my grandmother. We, my, <laughs> I grew up in a time when a lot of people didn't have a television and my grandmother had a television. And the Ed Sullivan show came on Sunday nights. And there would be people in our neighborhood who would come to my grandmother's house to watch the television show. And when we would sit on my grandmother's porch, there would be people who would be walking by or driving by, hey, Miss Ella, how are you doing? And she loved people, she loved the church. She just had a heart of gold and, um, she wasn't a pushover, but she was a great, great, great woman. Wow. One of the questions usually I ask is, who is your role model? But I don't think I need to ask that anymore. That would be <laughs> Ella May Durr. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, it certainly feels like she's a wonderful woman. She um, was. The next question I had for you is, if you had to change one rule in the government process, what would that be? I would make sure that legislators got paid more money. I really think that they are woefully, woefully underpaid. And unfortunately, because people don't understand what they do, and a lot of people seem to think that they make a whole lot of money, if they gave themselves a raise, which they are so long overdue in need of, they could face consternation that would then maybe put them back on the sidelines. So I would change that because first of all, they have to deal with lobbyists. They have to deal with the people across the aisles. They have to deal with people within their um, their parties, they have to deal with so much making so little money. So you can tell I've thought about this as well. And I don't care if they are a Democrat or a Republican, they do not get paid enough to do the work that they do because I can tell you all 170 members are so committed to what they are doing and who they represent. And unfortunately, the pay doesn't meet what they do. And how would you educate the public the significant role they play? I don't know, because there would be so many other voices 
drowning out the truth. Uh, I, I, I have a dear friend who was talking to me many, many years ago who worked in state agency and she was kvetching thinking how much money they were making. Well, guess what? That dear friend became a legislator. She had an aha moment. Wow. And she used to say they're over there making, I said, no, they're not. They're not making that money. I talked to someone several months ago who thought that they were making, I said, no, no, they're not making all of that money. Stop saying that. So I, I don't know how to erase the perception because these guys are public servants, but they shouldn't have to live below the poverty wage in order to serve the public that they all, 170 of them, are committed to doing. Now, whether or not you agree with their policy and their procedures, that's a whole different ball of wax. I don't have the stamina to do it. I don't have the money to do it. I don't have the will to do what they do. And I will applaud all 170 of them because of their commitment to their constituents. Well said. And how would you educate the public the role of a lobbyist? Oh, and then there you go again, <laughs> because we get such a bad rap. <laughs> <laughs> We're the devils, you know. <laughs> and again, I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, people don't understand what we do. They, they, they hear that, you know, lobbyists are the ones who are putting money into the coffers and, you know, swaying people because of the money that uh, we put into their political coffers. Well, look, we are down there educating legislators about our issues. And also when we're talking with them, we also need to understand the opposing viewpoint because these guys want to know. They want to be informed. And so as lobbyists, we need to be up on the issues so that once we walk into that legislator's office, and we're beginning to get peppered with questions. We need to know the answers. And so I think the general public, when again, a lot of my friends are well-educated, well-traveled and well-versed. But I can tell you, I've had a few of them who would refer to the people on Jones Street as Congress folks, Congress members. No, oh, that's not it, you know. So then not really understanding what a lobbyist does based on the perception that the media put out there, that again would be a yeoman's job. I think we have to whittle away with it one conversation at a time so that people can really understand that at the end of the day, we're there to protect the interest of our clients. And by doing that, we have to educate members at the legislature in hopes that they see our point of view and believe in what we're saying and believe in the cause and also understand how this would impact their constituents to vote yay or nay on an issue that we are supporting or we are working against. If you had a time capsule and you got to get in it, and you can go any time past in the past, what time would you go to? Oh, now that is a good one. I, I, oh, where would I go? In what time frame? Being maybe to the Harlem Renaissance, maybe to Harlem, when some of the greatest minds, some of the greatest artists, some of the greatest philosophers and musicians were all trying to figure this thing out in terms of the place of African-Americans in this society, in this moment in America and beyond. I would love to sit down and talk to Josephine Baker or, um, Oh, oh, I can't think of his name right off. Just so many people who I would like to understand not only their greatness, but their souls, their spirit, 
And this group of people who, in spite of what was happening around them, they were able to create the kind of synergy where so much interesting things came out of their commitment to forward thinking in spite of how things were being imparted on them during that time. So I would like to be a part of that group where they survived in spite of. Very good answer. And how would you um, educate the youth, especially the minorities, the role of government relations? And why do you think they should be involved? You know, we just started this year. We set up an, an internship for students who are at one of the HBCUs in North Carolina, and there are 10. And our first uh, NC10 intern came from Shaw University. And when we were going through the process of interviewing some of the students to come on board, she was really interested in the chamber and some of the community work that we did. She was thinking of the Raleigh Chamber. And that's not atypical of a lot of people who will think that we are the Raleigh Chamber, but we are the NC Chamber. And oftentimes they would think that we are a government agency. So there's no shade on her saying that. So when she came, she began to clearly understand the need to vote because she began to understand how all of that works together locally, statewide and national. And I said to her, I said, if you and yours do not get it together and go to vote again, I don't care how you do it. I don't care who you vote for when you go into the voting booth, but you have to understand the importance of voting. I think what happened uh, during the Obama era he was able to ignite a group of youngsters who came to the polls to vote. Where I think the disconnect happened was once he was elected the first term and had fired up this group that was not connected politically, there was no more going back to them and keeping them connected because they thought the work had been done. The brilliance of what Trump did, he ignited a group and he kept them engaged. He understood when you got this group, you can't just sit them on the shelf and do what you do for four years. And we see what that has done for his group. They have continued to be engaged and they have built upon that foundation where the group that was energized by Obama's campaign who were novices to politics, they were left in the cold. And to go back and try to regenerate that, it's not an easy task. So what I would say to young people, get engaged and stay engaged irrespective of what you believe or don't, at the end of the day, that vote is so powerful, so powerful. And it's powerful with the local municipality races, with the state races, and with the national races. Wow, that's a, that's a really good statement and powerful too. What is the hardest part about your job? Well, for me, because there's so much in information, I'm responsible for education, talent supply, unemployment insurance, child care, and housing. Now, staying abreast and getting all the information, sometimes it can be a little overwhelming because what do I need to know now? Who do I need to go talk to? I would say staying abreast and reading constantly is something for me that I really have to put forth an effort. I learn by listening 
then I'll read. But to read, I have to really sit down and put forth an effort. And for me, that's the most difficult thing is to do that. And I'm very intentional because in the mornings, I normally wake up around five o'clock. I grab this uh, iPhone. I go in and I start reading all of the political pieces that come in my email. I read that. Then, of course, I listen to NPR. And oftentimes, what WUNC is saying, I have read. And then on the way to the office, I listen to one of the political podcasts that I should listen to for the week. Then I go into the office. Then I listen to my colleagues talking about transportation, infrastructure, environment. And it's like, oh my gosh, that is a whole lot. And I should know some of that, but my little pea brain won't allow me to absorb as deeply because I have these other issues that I have to. So sometimes I want to just pull my hair out, but it's like, Deborah, just chill. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. <laughs> so I would say that's the most uh, daunting thing for me is all of the information that comes at me on a daily basis. Fair enough. Um, and let's jump a little bit back into your childhood. Um, where did you grow up and were you interested in politics at all? Well, I was born in Brooklyn and was reared in um, Hickory. And politics, no. I am a creative at heart. I grew up watching television and I would sit there and I would ask my mom, why are some televisions, uh, some television shows shiny and others are dull? And they couldn't see it. And it had to do with the lighting and it was had to do if they were shooting with film or video. And I learned that through deciding that when I went to college, I wanted to go into television. So I had a radio show at Norfolk State. Um, and it got a write-up in the newspaper to listen to my show, which was a jazz show. I was doing um, television production. And in fact, when I was in high school, um, the, the, the PBS station in Chicago wanted to take a look at uh, integration and segregation in the Southern schools. And they chose Hickory High to come and do um, a piece on integration because Hickory High at that time, every year would have a race riot. It was like clockwork. And so this began a, a process to start peeling back what was going on in Hickory in our public schools. I was a part of that production team. So I saw the lights, camera actions come in. I got a chance to write because they engaged the students. So we got a chance to write, perform and act for this PBS station out of Chicago. So that really piqued my interest because I was beginning to think I wanted to be a lawyer because I was on uh, the SGA and I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. But when they came in with that, then it started clicking about why I could see the difference that my mother couldn't see on television. So I began to understand that. So I went to Norfolk State and majored in mass communications, learned how to speak properly on the air, learned how to produce and write. And then I got um, accepted into television production at Brooklyn College and started really learning how to do that. I shot for the American Theater Wing and we had such great teachers. We had, um, I can't think of her name, but she wrote for the Christian Science Monitor. We had Jack Cuny, who used to be a producer for CBS. And one of Jack's good friends was the producer for the Andy Griffith Show. And so when he came to New York to speak to my class, Jack had me to go pick him up from the airport because he wanted Jack, Jack wanted him to know me because he was getting ready to do another show, shoot a pilot for a television show that Jack was hoping that I would get a chance to work on because of my work that I had done at Brooklyn College while working on my master's. 
well, the palette didn't get picked up. I didn't go back the second year because I was a poor student in New York City. And there's no worse place to be poor is in New York City. So I stayed home um, a summer and volunteered some time at a and State University at their radio station. While there, the general manager invited me to, to work permanently. And I took a job there, taught television production there, and then would eventually go down to South Carolina State to teach a television class and help them put their radio station on the air. So I always tell people I forest gumped my, my way into politics. I really did. Because politics, that was something that other people did. It wasn't for me. I had it at the core, at my heart, I am a creative. Nice. So yeah, I see your career and you know, you can clearly see that you're very good at talking and communicating. <laughs> So, and what was the turning point? At what point did you switch gears and feel like, you know, this is something you want to try? Frustration. While I was working at SCE TV, I was producing a television show called Job Man Caravan. Then I went over into scripted services where we produced and wrote for state agencies and nonprofit organizations. And I was trying to figure out a way to learn more about becoming a producer for, I can't think of the national show that SCE TV was a presenting sponsor. So I knew the way to do that was to get back into the front office so that I could understand how to get into independent producing but someone who was in the front office who said to me, and it broke my heart, she said, Deborah, they're not going to let you into the front office. And it was for the obvious reason. And it broke my heart. So I stayed working where I was, did very well. Well, I got a scholarship to, to study with Mimi Edmonds, who at that point was a producer with uh, 60 Minutes. I studied with her for two weeks at the television and film school that is an international film school up in Rockport, uh, Maine. And that was one of the greatest experiences. And one day while I was sitting at my desk, some friends of mine had joined um, an exploratory committee for a guy who decided that he was going to run for Congress and he needed a press secretary. And so a couple of my friends said, you know, you should look at Deborah Durr. And because of my frustration, I said, okay, I'll do it, right? I did the forest gump, I got some chocolate, I'll eat this one. And I ate the chocolate, he won. Still, I wasn't thinking about going to DC. I was thinking about, okay, now I have done this, what do I do next? I had left SCETV. He called me in the office and said, listen, they're telling me I can't keep my press operations here. I have to bring it to D.C. Will you go? OK. So I picked up my daughter. We had a backyard, a front yard, a clothesline and a little puppy. I picked her up, plopped her down on Connecticut Avenue in a little apartment, worked on the hill. And fortunately, my aunt's best friend lived in D.C., and she took care of my daughter while I worked, took her to ballet, picked her up from school. And I did that for about almost two years. And DC is, again, it's not a place to be broke because working for a freshman congressman, you don't make a lot of money. And I was picked up from uh, DC by Richard Stevenson, uh, who at that time was the county manager here in Wake county and um, worked for him, went back into public affairs, and the rest is history. Wow. What an interesting Richard story. Richard Stevens. Uh, Richard Stevens. I'm sorry. What an interesting story. So mm -hmm. you stepped into this public affairs, and what did you feel about it, and what was different about it? Well, public affairs, again, is, is, it's just a natural offshoot of what I was doing uh, as a television producer, a radio announcer. It was writing and 
um, having and, and as a, as a press secretary strategically uh, thinking through what should be the um, the messaging for the county. And so it was great. It, it was great. And I did that with Richard and was on his team for a couple of years. And I think I'm trying to remember the, the process, but um, I think after there was um, there was a change in administration and with that change, my job changed. And I went on, and I think from there, I think I eventually started working at St. Augustine's College. And then I went back into the creative side with UNC TV as promotion manager over there, which I really enjoyed. And then one day I was sitting at my desk, another Forrest Gump episode, someone calls and said, Bell South is looking for someone. I think you would be great as a lobbyist. And I was so dismissive. I said, well, you know, I'm working hard for peanuts now. I can work hard for more money. And um, again, I forced Gump my way into that job because I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't looking for politics. No more was I looking for politics in South Carolina. And I got the job. I got the job and I worked there for about eight or nine years before I, I transitioned into um, another political uh, uh, um, position and then did that and then went back into just doing st stuff for the chamber in terms of membership. And again, I'm sitting in my office Forrest gumped my way back into politics. One of the lobbyists came in, closed the door and said, look, I need you to come and lobby with me. It's like, okay, I'll do it. And again, so they have pulled me in <laughs> and I'm glad to say that I'm in one of the best places to, to do what I do under the leadership of Gary Salamito as our president CEO. And the person I report to directly is is Ray Starling, who's one of the greatest guys in the world. So, and I work with some of the greatest people. So I'm very, very fortunate. So you um, had mentioned you jumped into this field of NC Chamber, um, at, at the organization of NC Chamber. Can you tell the public what NC Chamber is all about? The NC Chamber in a nutshell is here to make sure that the business community can thrive in this state. Um, and I always tell people, there are about 23 of us on a good day who work for the chamber. And that is our sole mission is to make sure, to make sure that the business climate is one that it would be in conducive so that whatever business you have in North Carolina, you can grow that business, that business can be healthy and it can be one where people are excited about creating other opportunities to establish a business here in North Carolina. And I think the proof is in the pudding with CNBC just designating us as the number one state to do business in this country. So that is, that is, that doesn't just happen just by mistake. It takes people understanding what is needed so that if a business is thriving, that means its workforce is thriving. That means its community is thriving. That means a lot of other tangential entities are thriving. As the Secretary of Commerce said last week at our Education and Workforce Conference, is it perfect? No, but are we working towards that? And is that our North Star? Is that where we want to go? Yes. So there are always opportunities to be better, always. And what I like about the Chamber, we don't back down from those opportunities to do better and to get it right. And I always like to say, and no one can do it better than we do it. Mm -hmm. 
and and what makes um or how does north carolina fare uh, compared to other states in terms of where it stands in terms of its position at in businesses well with us historically on that uh, poll nationally not only with cnbc but others we have constantly and consistently been ranked within the top 10 top 15 over a good amount of years. So I, I think when we look at, you know, having the community college system, having the UNC system, having 10 historically black colleges and universities in North Carolina. And when we look at, we used to be called the good road state. And so we're working back towards doing that. When we start looking at what are going to be the needs of the future? When we look at the needs of today, when we have people who are putting forth an, an, an effort to make sure your itty bitties have a great state in which to grow up in, uh, and they're preparing for it now, that's what makes North Carolina, North Carolina, the number one, because I'm saying all other states are doing it, but do we have the brain power? Do we have the, the getty up and go? Do we have the chutzpah to make it work? Yes, we do. North Carolina does. And I will go back to those 170 members down at the legislature. No matter where you see them, no matter where you stand, they all come with the idea that they want to make this state better. Whether or not you agree with the process or not, I'm not talking about that, but I just know all 170, based on getting out there, hitting the pavement, wanting to come down to Jones Street to make a difference, they want that as well. So they can stand up and be a part of that, making, number, making North Carolina the number one state in which to do business as well. Well said. I would like to move on to the final segment where you get to talk anything about yourself, um, the future, your organization, um, or any kind of advice you would like to share to upcoming lobbyists? Well, I, I give this advice to any of my, my friends who are younger, that always do the right thing for the right reason. And as they say, even when people are not looking, don't sweat it because at the end of the day, it's working out in your favor. And if I can teach people to get out of your own way, just do the right thing. And you might not get it from that person, but there's somebody else who's gonna come in and help you. That is what I will tell people. I don't care what your field is. And I will tell you, I got, some of the great advice from my former manager, Jeff Van Dyke, who taught me everything I know about lobbying. And, um, oh gosh, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna call him out because they both gave me great advice. Jeff said to me when I started lobbying, you speak to everybody. And he meant everybody. Nobody was too big or too small to acknowledge. Well, I already knew that because Ella May Durr, but to hear someone say that, that everybody means something. And then he also said, there are 170 votes. Don't ever take one for granted. Okay. Then, oh gosh, I wish I could think of his last name, but at that time he was working in the Easley administration and when he and his colleague would come into the legislative building, it was like two rock stars had appeared. I mean, the Republicans and the Democrats, everyone, oh, hey. And he said to me, he said, down here, your word is bond. So don't tell a lie, stuck with me. And one other person, uh, who was a legislator when I started lobbying. And Flossie, oh, I can't think of her name, last name either. She said, honey, let me tell you something. 
if you think what's going down on that floor when they're voting is what is really happening, then you are misled. You have to work really hard before that stuff starts taking place on the, on, on, on the floor. So I got those three very sound and sage advice from three people who had no idea the impact that that has made on me. And I will say that to any young lobbyist to understand that your word is your bond. What you see is not always what's happening. You have to work in order to come into the gallery and hope that what happens on that floor, you have done all the work before that gets on the floor. And remember, everybody means something, irrespective if they have a vote or if they're pushing a broom. Very well said. Um, I know before we started this conversation, uh, which you kind of uh, led to and you said you were an introvert, which completely mm -hmm. took me aback. Uh, with the, <laughs> so can you tell us like, you know, um, what kind of personality one should possess um, to be a good lobbyist? I think one, you have to be confident. And I think there's a level of humility that needs to come with that. And you have to be able to be okay and admit when you're wrong. And I will say back again, humility. I think that is, that takes you so to such a place where you never ever knew it could take you. Because again, Everybody has a story. Everybody has a mission. And another thing, please just don't take everything, anything personal. It's, it's just not that kind of environment because a person who votes against you today can be for you tomorrow. A lobbyist who, one, one of my dear friends, she and I understand, look, she works in the, with the government agency and she'll say, well, where does this chamber stand on in this? Well, we are not like that. Okay, fine. Well, we're going to disagree, but we can have a drink and we can laugh and talk. But we also know that we represent sometimes two different viewpoints and nobody's throwing shade at the other one. No one is upset because the people that we represent are saying, this is where we stand and the line has been drawn. But at the end of the day, we're just two women trying to make, as I, as I like to say, make it do what it do. And that's what most people down there are doing. They're just trying to make it do what it do. But in that process, how are you making it do? How are you making it do what it needs to be done? Can you still have an air of humility and kindness, understanding that we all are trying to make it do what it do? Deborah? I just wanted to say that um, you definitely have all the required skills and the heart to be um, what your grandmom wants you to be. Thank you so much for taking this time and spending it with me. For Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for asking me.